Okay. All righty. We're going to look at Celtic spirituality and um, I and I actually realize this all also is, I mean, it's mostly focused on Celtic Christianity, which of course is a kind of a spirituality. There are many kinds of Celtic spirituality and we might mention a few of those just to clarify what we're doing. I did want to mention uh, before we start with the material that the pictures throughout are from the Book of Kells. And I don't know if you know about the Book of Kells. Um, it's, it was probably um, written in Iona, that wonderful um, monastery on um, the island of Iona and probably before 807 AD. And um, it's attributed to uh, St. Colum Chiel. In 807, the Vikings came, they stole the book. Um, when it was re found, when it was relocated really, um, it had lost the covers because the covers probably had jewels on them. And they threw the book in a hole and it got covered up by sod. And it has just all these gorgeous artworks and, and uh, calligraphy and everything. It's really interesting that the material part, the cover of the book, which really wasn't even the reason the book was written, was stolen. And the content of the book was thrown away. It was lost um, for two months and 20 days, according to this wonderful book I got from the um, British Museum. And, um, and then it was returned. It, and then it was moved to Kells, which is on the East Coast. Iona is um, pretty far north on, off the West Coast of Scotland. So um, it, it now, they have a wonderful uh, viewing area and it resides in Trinity College, Dublin. If you go to Dublin sometimes, you really must see it. It's really remarkable. And they have a, a lot of um, copies and you know, poster sized pictures, pictures of this work so that you can see it in more detail. When I saw it, they hadn't made that um, reception center. And we went in and we saw about four pages under glass of the actual um, book and, and it was kind of dark, so it wouldn't hurt it. So now you can see a lot more of it. And I'm sure they have still have that other available. So each one will have um, a beginning uh, symbol or a carpet page. And uh, you'll see one of those later, later about Celtic spirituality. Some of you might know Bill Finlaw. Um, he was, he, he, yeah, he's not alive anymore. So he was a um, Episcopal priest. He um, preached at St. John's sometimes. He was also a therapist. And I heard him once in a sermon, take the first um, part of John. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And he um, made a case for substituting word with the powerful presence. The idea was that whoever had an education, they were usually in the church and, and um, usually in monasteries, not many people could, you know, well, hardly anyone in literature in a monastery could read or write in the 800s in, um, in the islands there. And so you were a powerful presence if you could read the Bible and discuss it. So when we do that, to me, this gets very close to the effect this may have had originally, or the, um, the message originally. In the beginning was the powerful presence. The powerful presence, and the powerful presence was with God, and the powerful presence was God. The same powerful presence was in the beginning with God. The powerful presence became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only, as in the only begotten son, who came from the father, full of grace and truth. That powerful presence that 
presence that um, we experience when very we're very close to God or when there is an experience that we feel like God is present. Um, the Holy Spirit, that is, as to me, as good a description as God is, I think I could find. So this powerful presence was made flesh. Um, it was Christ. And he lived with us. He deigned to come down and live with us. And that powerful presence, of course, we still seek today. Um, early Celtic spirituality, um, and, and we're going to later do a meditation where um, that powerful presence could well be there, depending on how we feel about it. Um, how open we are and all that. Early Celtic spirituality begins around 3 to 6 AD. And um, there are some uh, different ways of looking at it and different understandings. Um, and they change depending on what the research, what the current research is. But as of now, some of the current understandings are the Celtic spirituality is sensitive to God and all creation, that um, it is experiencing that presence in creation and that the powerful presence of God um, in, of creation is the maker being manifest in the makers, God's creation. That what God has created, he is still within. It's not really pantheism like in nature worshiping nature. It's not worshiping nature. It's being aware that things that happen in nature aren't necessarily coincidences, that things happen where God's presence is there and we feel it, we, we know it. Um, so some ideas about Celtic Christianity that scholars and others feel aren't quite on track is that there was a cohesive system of established churches in third century Ireland. And, and there wasn't. This, of course, third century is a long time ago. And there were itinerant people that came and um, taught and were um, witnessing to what they knew. But it, there, even when you had an early monastery, you know, around 700, 800, it was not really a cohesive um, unit. It was um, it it was it was more individuals going out and trying to bring Christianity to others, and so you didn't have a cohesive church there. Um, okay, and another erroneous idea is that the Celtic Church was opposed to the Roman Church. Early on, frankly, the Celtic church was not as developed, of course, as the Roman church was at that time. This was a hinterland. This was the this was um, kind of the backwoods, if you will, of, um, of civilization in um, Scotland and in Ireland and particularly the northern areas. And it was not Rome. It was not the Mediterranean where there was a lot of um, in, in Jerusalem, a lot of people, a lot of traffic, a lot of sharing of ideas. So it was, it had a closeness to nature that I think most early, early uh, people must have felt. There's no way to prove that, but I think so. Um, but it was not a set church early on that was made and was in contrast to the Roman church. It was, it wasn't an early church. Then there's also the idea that uh, Celtic spirituality contains what is missing from modern spirituality. And, um, you know, spirituality um, doesn't have just one way of presenting itself, right? The spiritual comes in kind of sometimes when we least expect it. And so the spirituality can have now can have similarities with Celtic spirituality, but it isn't necessarily the spirituality 
that changes. It is how much we are open to it and, and how, we, um, how, we, how we open ourselves to it and notice. Um, and when I wrote that about spirituality can have similarities with Celtic spirituality and, and I was thinking, how do you describe it? And I thought of the sound of music, how do you hold a wave upon the sand? It's a living thing. You, you know, there's not just one way of experiencing God's presence, of course. So um, that's a, the idea that it contains what's missing from modern spirituality. Um, people are, can be just as spiritual now as they've ever been. It depends on whether or not they take the time for it and, and are interested in that. And um, anyway, so... Um, Early Celtic um, spiritual, spirituality was brought um, to Britain by Tertullian and Origen, and those are, and you probably, you may have heard of them. They're very, um, they were priests and teachers uh, from the third century, and they first came. Then St. Patrick, of course, comes to Britain, and, um, and when I say Britain, I, I mean Ireland, Scotland, and parts of England in the fifth century. Um, and so it, they had different people coming through and teaching. Over time, the church, when it started developing in Ireland and Scotland, um, was it was not, the abbot was not the most powerful person in the monastery. It was more relaxed. It, it didn't have all of the um, formal trappings and, and rules. They allow children to come in and be educated, um, which most monasteries, they might go out to teach, but they didn't necessarily have children. Uh, I can't help but think after teaching running in the halls, you know, they kind of had a different aesthetic for that. And, um, and the bishop, it was, it was Episcopal centered. It was, the bishop was the most powerful person. And the abbots, some of them were not uh, even ordained. So uh, it was much looser. Um, it doesn't mean that they weren't as devout. It's just the organization was um, looser, which you'd really kind of expect in a hinterland that hadn't had a formal monast monastic structure before. Um, what happened over time is that a... Um, a position as abbot or as a priest would often be handed down to someone in the family, in that person's family. And so you ended up with a dynastic kind of continuation in the um, Irish church where it was going through families. Of course, later in the Middle Ages, we have some problems with that. It wasn't just in Ireland, but you, you, we have some problems and that, I mean, I can get into medieval history and you'll never get to finish this, but um, had some problems where um, the first son inherits so the other sons with primogeniture, the other sons go to the church because that's how they're going to make their living. And so sometimes it is not, um, it, it results in a uh, person being a priest who is not as committed as he might have been. Um, okay, Celtic um, Christianity travels from Ireland to Scotland and then to the wider Christian world. And it usually, um, especially to me when I think of a Celtic Christianity, but it usually is tied in with the idea of a real closeness to nature, a real openness to the spirit in whatever way it comes. Um, almost a looking for where the spirit uh, comes in to one's life. And, um, and I think particularly with Ireland, where um, there's such a, what's the word I want? There's such a um, affinity with seeing um, the spiritual in the surroundings around one, um, even now. And so I think that um, that Celtic Christianity, that's often a part of what we think about it, of it, think of it. The early challenges and adaptations to, um, to um, 
the Irish early Celtic Christianity, they had to establish a date for Easter that worked. And the Church of Rome had one, uh, the Eastern Church ends up having one, um, and it didn't work for the Irish and the Scottish, that date did not work, probably because it was a lot colder up there. And it's kind of hard to have this celebration of life in Easter when it is so bitter cold. Now that that is, I have seen nowhere in research, but I'm just thinking if you're, if you're, if you're a simple person, simple as in not in a sophisticated culture, super sophisticated culture, and you're, you're looking for the reawakening of life in the spring, you just aren't going to get it that early as you would in Italy. So don't quote me on that, but that's my, my opinion. Um, so they ended up having a different system for the dating of Easter than the Roman church. And it, the dating for Easter, the way they found Easter at the time between um, Ireland and Britain, it was not used anywhere else at the time. So that really set it apart. Um, they also had private penance. You had you went to your priest and you had a penance, but you didn't go around um, beating yourself in public, you know, with hair, a little leather, um, you know, whips or anything or wearing a hair shirt that people could see. It was a private thing. And um, that was different than what was going on then in the Roman church. And one of the other things, and I think that's the last, um, well, there's one other thing, is that um, there was the idea of being in exile for Christ and going where the spirit wanted you to go. So much so that people would get in boats. There's stories of people getting in boats and they just let the wind and the waves take them where they were supposed to be, which Sometimes you wonder where in the world they ended up, um, but that was part of being open to where Christ led. So it was a, called an exile for Christ or in Latin, peregrinatio pro Christo, um, leaving what you're sure of and used to and launching out with faith and in, in leaving their safety in God's hands. We still do the same thing. We make career changes or have changes thrust upon them, as, as Shakespeare said in Hamlet. But um, we are out there in our boat and we're in a situation we didn't um, expect like the pandemic. And we are in some ways, especially in the worst of it, in exile for Christ, the idea that we're doing it for Christ. So it's um it's a, it's that's an interesting idea thinking of the pandemic as exile for Christ, isn't it? I wonder if that make us use our time differently. So the last thing about the um, changes and adaptations is that um, people could move in and out of the monastic world. It was permeable. You could go in and study and um, and then you could leave. You could leave and go on one of those exile trips where you preach and you're a disciple and you, and you um, teach as you go along. You could decide you just needed a time off. You know, you, you didn't have to stay in there in that monastery. And it, I'm tempted to say, and, and of course I, I haven't been in Iona in the winter. I've been there in the summer, which was lovely, but I imagine it, it probably feels like a bit of a harsh exile when you've got cold north wind and, and all of that. But that there seems to be um, less harshness about whether or not you stay and do that, that one thing you were there for you could leave and you could come back and you could travel, you could come back, you could stay for some education and you could leave. And so it was more permeable than a regular monastery. Okay. And stop me if you have a question or we can wait till the end, however you wanna do it. Okay. Now in 20th century, becoming more aware of God's presence and Really, if you have something else you can think of besides these four, these are ones that have met 
a great deal to me. But meditation, even when it's not a formal meditation, when you're meditating and you're sitting quietly and you're watching your breath and you're relaxing, um, those kinds of things slow us down. And we, it puts us in a, uh, a relaxed state of mind that we're more aware of what's going on around us. Um, and even days after we've done that. I know people who meditate every day um, and it's, it really uh, makes a big difference. Resting in nature, and it, that of course can be a form of meditation where we're sitting in a beautiful place or um, we have a screened in back porch where you can hear the birds and everything and resting in it and just um, slowing ourselves down. Um, slowing ourselves down seems to be a real key to all of this so that we can become aware of what's happening. Noticing coincidences, which of course aren't coincidences at all a lot of times, those can be noticed more readily when we have slowed down and we start noticing what's around us. And of course, praying for insight more, more than once a day. I mean, praying for that and, and, be, and waiting for it, being aware and waiting for that um, as you go through the day. Um, looking for the answer to that prayer and that kind of insight. Um, and we are going to do a meditation from this wonderful book um, that I simply love. And this is, this is it. That is a carpet page, by the way. That is a full page in the Book of Kells that um, they call it a carpet page by the way it looks. It is a cross with a double horizontal bar, which is really interesting. A lot of times we see the cross as the top vertical from God to the world at the bottom, and then from us to other people. And this is like, to a lot of other people. I don't know what they were thinking when they did it, nobody knows, but it's it's beautiful. And if, if you can make that larger on your computer screen, um, and I, I hesitate to touch this because I don't want to mess it up and <laughs> we lose our, our uh, presentation here, but the minute work is incredible. It's just the artwork is incredible. And that is opposite, no, it's not there yet. Okay, it's opposite a Cairo page. Um, God and Christ, it's on a, a later one. Okay, the cry of the deer. Meditations on the hymn of St. Patrick. This is actually the text. This is one of the most spiritual books I think I've ever read. And you can tell I like it a lot with all the, things hanging out of it. Um, it's by David Adam. Um, this is a book of meditations. He is, he was, I don't know if he's still alive. He was a vicar of Danby um, in North Yorkshire and um, Scotland. And he writes in a very uh, compelling, simple, and yet uh, wise way. I'd like to introduce you to the book. Um, and it's the, one of the subtitles is, uh, it's something like prayers in the Celtic tradition. The cry of the deer, the deer is Christ. The reason the deer is considered to be Christ is that the deer was the most, considered the most aristocratic of animals. And it was considered to be uh, uh, a symbol for Christ in the Celtic church. I had a friend once who had a dream with a, a, a deer coming to her in the woods. And I thought, wow, that <laughs> with, it, with it being a symbol of, um, of Christianity. Okay, this book tries to make us more aware of um, the presence of God. And he mentions, and I'm gonna go through and share a few uh, parts of this with you. 
that the presence of God is an eternal fact. He never leaves us alone or forsakes us. It is when we lose sight of him that we falter and seek beneath the waves. We need to regain a clear vision of the presence with a capital P to perceive the reality of his relationship with us and act upon it. He uses the circling where a person surrounds themselves with the spirit of God. And that's a very Celtic thing. It's one reason that they had a lot of circles in their art and curves. And one of these, and I'll read it slowly. You may want to think about this. It's a prayer. And it says, circle me, O God. Keep hope within. Despair without. Circle me, O God. Keep peace within. Keep turmoil out. Circle me, O God. Keep calm within. Keep storms without. Circle me, O God. Keep strength within. Keep weakness out. He's, he mentions we have no power of ourselves. We often think we do when we forget. Um, and he said this Celtic idea of the encircling was really important to early Celts and, and still to uh, people who appreciate Celtic spirituality. It's called the Kame. I think I'm pronouncing it right. It's C-A-I-M. He mentions that it is not, um, you know, a charm or anything like that, that he uses it as a prayer. Um, and he's a priest. Um, he uses it as a prayer to realize that God is right with us, all around us, being with us. There is a, um, a phrase that he uses, the encompassing of the spirit be around you, the encompassing of the strength of God. And he says, this is how to begin our day, to arise in the presence each morning. Don't you love that? I love it. Um, we are, we're going to do a meditation now, um, if that's all right with you, if not. You don't want to participate in it and you don't like it. You can always mute us for a little while, <laughs> but I think it's, it's wonderful. So if you can get your feet on the ground and get comfortable and flat on the ground and uh, breathe in and exhale and, and get relaxed. Let's pause. Let's let ourselves relax. Breathe in and let the tension go out of your body. Let all troubled thoughts out of your mind. Make space in your life for something to happen. Make room for God. Let go and let God. Breathe slowly and deeply. Be still. Know that God is with you. Discover that God is with you. God unseen, yet ever near. Thy presence may I feel. The presence is to be enjoyed. Let God take over. Be aware of him and rest in his presence. Lord, you are here. Help us to know it. Lord, you are love. Help us to receive you.
Picture what God's presence means for you today. God is with you. You dwell in him and he in you. He is with you at rest, at work, and at play. We are never alone. There is an abiding presence, strength, love, peace, forgiveness are ever at hand. Christ's presence will go with you and he will give you rest. I will arise today through a mighty strength, through the power of the Trinity. Amen. He talks about seeing others in Christ, and he gives a wonderful, wonderful um, anecdote from Turgenev, the Russian author. And this is what the anecdote is. All at once, some man came up and stood beside me. I did not turn toward him. But at once I felt that this man was Christ. Emotion, curiosity, awe overmastered me suddenly. I made an effort and I looked at my neighbor. A face like everyone's, a face like all men's faces. What sort of Christ is this, I thought. I turned away. But I had hardly turned my eyes from this ordinary man when I felt again that it really was none other than Christ standing beside me. Again, I made an effort. And again, the same face, like all men's faces, the same everyday, though unknown features. And suddenly my heart sank and I came to myself. Only then I realized that such a face, a face like all men's faces, is the face of Christ. He mentioned that in the Catholic Church, there's a very thin line between what divides, that, that divides the saints triumphant for those of us on earth. Um, those who have been received into glory or have died are still very much alive, he says. They are not men and women of the past, but daughters and sons of God who are alive now and in the fullness of eternal life. The communion of saints is a reality to be experienced. And often the Celt would choose one of the saints for his sole friend someone that they could talk to, that they love and, and know, maybe one of the, um, the uh, gospel prophets, or it's certainly Christ, um, to have a relationship with and, um, and talk, talk to. Um, and there are two more things that I was going to um, share. Um, he mentions that the most important thing is that we live in the fullness of time and we need to take time. And that the Celt, uh, Celtic spirituality has that slowing down and that taking time. The real reason we don't take time is feeling that we have to keep moving. And he calls us a sickness. We live in the fullness of time Every moment is God's good time, his keros. We need to give our, ourselves in prayer a chance to realize that we have what we seek, that God is here and we have it. He suggests, and, and I'll end with this, uh, reading this um, he says, you know, once a day, um, the Lord is here. His spirit is with us. We need not fear. 
His spirit is with us. We are surrounded by love. His spirit is with us. We are immersed in peace. His spirit is with us. We abide in hope. His spirit is with us. We travel in faith. His spirit is with us. We live in eternity. His spirit is with us. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. This is very much um, part of the Celtic tradition to have affirmations, to have a physical kind of um, uh, movement that helps us remember um, that God is with us. I want to, and, and <clears throat> I put in here a few things <clears throat> from the breastplate of St. Patrick, but I can see we're running out of, a little bit out of time. And I want to, um, I want to mention that this awareness, and I wrote this down, but I don't need the notes to remember it, um, that um, this awareness comes to us um, when we are open, when we have made time, um, very, a very Celtic thing, and often through nature, because these coincidences happen that are not coincidences. And I want to uh, mention one that really changed how I, I saw nature and these kinds of experiences. We had a very good friend and our very good friend had been in Vietnam. He had been a fighter pilot. My dad was a fighter pilot and we just all got along with him and his wife really well. And he ended up having a brain tumor <clears throat> from Agent Orange in Vietnam. He had been a Marine fighter pilot and um, it finally caught up with him. He finally, um, the tumor was growing. He, they really couldn't take any more uh, of it out and have him be himself. Um, and he knew he only had a certain amount of time. And such a, such a wonderful person. Well, we knew that he had had the surgery. In fact, we were there in the waiting room when he had the surgery and were with his wife. A number of people were there in the waiting room. And um, we got through all of that and we came home. And that was a Saturday. And that the next day, Sunday morning, we were ready for church. We always went out the side door to the car, back down the driveway. For some reason, and I don't know why, well, I do know why, but we went out the front door and we had uh, Sultana or Impatience, whatever you want to call them, planted all the way down this long walkway that led to the driveway in that house. And they were yellow. They were, um, no, they were pink. They were pink um, impatience. And so we went out the front door. We were walking down the, the path and these impatience start rising up. They are twirling and rising up ahead of us and going up into the heavens. And I remember saying to my husband, look at all the butterflies. Have you ever seen so many butterflies? It was astounding. I mean, I never had before um, this that happened twice so after the second time. I've never seen that many butterflies. And they flew off. Well, we went to church. When we got back home, uh, we had a call. And that was the time at which our friend had died. It happened when he had died. So, of course, everyone was going over to his wife's house. And I went over a little while. But after the crowd had left a day or two later, I had a... Um, a sun catcher butterfly that someone had given me when I was having a hard time. And I had it in the kitchen window to remind me. And um, so I took it to her and I told her the story and I gave her the butterfly and she appreciated it. Well, after our friend's um, memorial service, he was cremated. He had told her he was a biologist after he got out of um, a marine biologist after he got out of the military. 
And he told her he wanted his ashes dropped at certain coordinates. They were specific coordinates um, in the Gulf. And um, so after the day or two after the service, his childhood friend and his best friend from, um, um, the, from Florida Wildlife Commission took, him, took her out in a boat with the ashes. And they used the proper, you know, I don't know what you call it, the locator to get that uh, specific spot. And when they got there, it was being circled by those butterflies, the same color butterflies. So they dropped the ashes there. And then um, she came back and, and she told us, well, a year later on the one year anniversary of his death, I actually was heading to her house for a meeting. And once again, there were butterflies those butterflies, not the same ones, but the same color, on the impatience going down the, the path. The scripture came to me while that was happening, and I thought, who is this man that the wind and the waves obey him? God speaks to us in so many different ways. And the idea, I mean, I've, we all needed that. We needed to know we were really raw and we needed to know that he was okay and that um, he was all right. And we took that as a sign that he was. Uh, many other things have happened. I'm sure that, excuse me, they've happened to you. Uh, one of them that I really um, love, um, this is a quick one, is that when my dad died, we were all really close to him, and he was an Air Force fighter pilot. We had his service over in Barrancas at the National Cemetery. And when we came back, my sister had been in high school when he was stationed at Tyndall in Panama City. And she and her friends in high school would go to Jimmy's Drive-In, which isn't there anymore after Michael. Um, and she said, let's go to Michael's. And we were, <laughs> we were really grief chicken. She said, I mean, to Jimmy, she said, let's go to Jimmy's and have hamburgers to heck with not eating hamburgers and buns and things. And I said, that's great. Dad had told me before he died. Um, I, I was just, I said, dad, I'm not looking forward to this at all. He knew he was dying and he was eager to see mother. He was doing fine. And um, I said, I, I'm just not looking forward to this at all. And he said, when it gets rough, just remember that someday we'll all be together. We walked into Jimmy's and my sister went up to order and I said, I'll get the tables for, you know, we had about 14 people um, in this side room. I'll get some seats. And I walked in and do you remember from the, I guess, 60s, that raucous version of someday we'll be together? That was playing as loudly as you could possibly play it. That's a very Celtic thing to feel like there is such a thin space between us and the next world and the communion of saints and, and the spirit of the Lord. Um, so that um, is really a special one. Um, I recommend.